And now, please welcome Dr. Robert Pollan, Distinguished University Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also the founder and president of Pollan Energy and Retrofits, an Amherst, Massachusetts-based green energy company operating throughout the United States. His books include The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy, Contours of Dissent, U.S. Economic Fractures, and the Landscape of Global Austerity. He has worked as a consultant for the U.S. Department of Energy, the International Labor Organization, and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Dr. Pollan was selected by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the 100 leading global thinkers of 2013. Finally, his forthcoming book, Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal is co-authored by iconoclast Noam Chomsky. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for including me in this uh, really fascinating evening. Talk about uh, having hard acts to follow. Those were four tremendous plays. Uh, performed under, let's say, uniquely difficult circumstances. So my hat off to all of you for your really outstanding work. And in fact, what I'm going to talk about picks up uh, very closely on what you just heard in these four plays. So uh, I'm going to come at it as an economist, uh, academic researcher, and of course, I'm not going to be uh, performing a play. But I'll just give you some basics that I think will tie together some of the things that uh, we just saw uh, presented so powerfully. Um, let me just start with a big overview of our healthcare system in terms of dollars. Uh, then we'll talk about it in terms of people's well being. Um, in terms of dollars, uh, our healthcare system in the United States today, the most recent data from the government, tells us that we spend $3.6 trillion on healthcare, $3.6 trillion. Now that's a gigantic number, obviously, but to figure out more what it means, it constitutes about 18% of the entire economy as, as one of the, uh, the clips at the beginning of this show uh, went through, uh, 18%, so that's almost, one in five dollars spent in the entire economy is spent on healthcare. And as that early clip also uh, noted, uh, other countries, other advanced economies, all of them. So we just saw a, a really excellent show about comparing somewhat the UK with the US. Uh, we heard references uh, to other countries in Europe and they all spend between about nine and 11% of GDP. So we spend 18%, they spend 9 and 11%. Now what's the difference in the US between if we spent 9%, 10% versus 18%? Well, that's one and a half trillion dollars. So we are spending one and a half trillion dollars more on healthcare than other countries in, in proportion uh, to the size of our economy. That boils down to $4,500 per person. So we spend $4,500 more per person than other countries do. Now, what do we get in terms of the outcome? Well, we just saw some brilliant performances show plays regarding two uh, features of our healthcare system. And I'm really glad the way that those were presented so powerfully. Uh, number one, is that we're spending, right, 18% of GDP, but 31 people are without, 31 million people are without insurance. That's 9% of the population. Another 26% of the population is what we would call underinsured. Now, what do we mean when we say underinsured? Well, usually I, I have to give a little explanation, but you just saw the play about the dad who was underinsured. Uh, who has, he has insurance. He just can't afford to go to a doctor because if he goes to a doctor, uh, the charges are gonna be exorbitant. And so people in that situation, according to polling evidence, 
uh, amount to 26% of the population, 86 million people. If you add up the 86 million who are underinsured and the 31 million who are fully uninsured, that brings us to 35%, fully one third of the population. Remember, we are also spending $4,500 more on average per person for healthcare and basically one third or more of the population is uh, without any uh, insurance or adequate insurance. Now, what is it? What about in terms of actual health outcomes? How does the U.S. system stack up when we're spending 18% of GDP, other countries spending 10, 11% of GDP? What about outcomes? Well, sometimes it's hard to measure outcomes, but there are some straightforward metrics uh, that we can use. For example, there are data that are available across countries on what we can call uh, medically avoidable deaths, okay? Medically avoidable deaths. Um, now, how does the U.S. stack up in terms of medically avoidable deaths? Well, we're 35th in the world. We're top in the world, we're number one in the world in terms of how much we spend on healthcare. We're 35th in the world in terms of medically avoidable deaths. We have a terrible healthcare system uh, as was so uh, beautifully dramatized in the plays that you just saw. We get inferior outcomes, uh, uh, preventable deaths. We have people living in fear, as you just saw, all the time. Uh, even if they have health insurance, they can't afford treatments. And uh, this is the system that we have. So we've seen this dramatized just now. I was just gonna mention one other story, which I think a true story, which dramatizes it. Maybe one of you wanna write a play about this, uh, which happened two years ago in Boston, uh, where a woman was getting off the, uh, the metro uh, train. She got her leg trapped in the, uh, the crack between the platform and the train, and she was stuck there, okay? and her, her leg was very badly damaged and people helped her to get out. What was she uh, totally insanely concerned about? She begged the people around her to not call an ambulance, not call an ambulance, despite the trauma that she had just been through. The, the trauma that she was experiencing most fully was the fact that she said, I can't afford the ambulance. She knew, however she knew, she sensed the ambulance to get to the hospital was gonna cost her about $2,000 uh, out of pocket and she wasn't gonna be able to afford it. So that's the healthcare system that we have. Now, of the people that do have insurance, over uh, about 50% of the population gets it through employment. And one of the arguments that is often made by supporters of our existing system is that people like the health care that they get through their employer. You can't take it away from them. They fought for it. Well, we've seen over and over again, uh, a year ago when General Motors went on strike, the workers went on strike, uh, what was the first thing the company did to gain leverage over the workers? They said, your health care is canceled. Go on strike. Your health care is canceled. Okay, uh, that was then. What about now? Well, well look at what's happening now. During the pandemic, 40 million people have lost their jobs since March, 40 million people. Uh, uh, a roughly 20 million have lost their health insurance, that they had health insurance and they lost it. Now in the first place, uh, when the guy uh, lost his health insurance, he and his mother were saying, well, I guess we can get COBRA. Well, yeah, you can get COBRA. COBRA means you can continue your insurance, but you pay for all of it out of pocket. If you want, during the discussion, we can talk about a proposal uh, to uh, extend Medicare for everyone who is now unemployed, a very, very critical, uh, very, very critical piece of legislation. Um, okay. Now, what's the solution? The solution is actually very simple and it was very nice. I really appreciated the 
the clip on me at the beginning, uh, the research that I've done on Medicare for All is really actually extremely simple, truly, truly really simple. There's a lot of complicated details, but the basic thing that's so simple is all I really had to do was look at the other countries. Uh, the other countries that are delivering better health outcomes, much better health outcomes, and guaranteeing universal coverage, nobody lives in the kind of fear, anxiety of financial ruin on top of uh, healthcare crises that we uh, in America live with all the time and that the plays convey so powerfully. So basically what we talk about with Medicare for All is uh, emulating what's already existing in every other advanced economy. So here are some points that I want to emphasize with respect to some things that we've come up with. So if we were to institute Medicare for All, you've heard, you heard politicians during the Democratic Party primaries. I won't mention any names, you know who I'm talking about. They say, wait, or uh, yeah, Medicare for all, it sounds beautiful, but how in the hell are we gonna afford it? How can we afford a $3 trillion system? You hear that all the time. Well, the problem with that argument is pretty simple. Yes, Medicare for all, as I'll go through in a second, will cost about 3 trillion, but our existing system costs 3.6 trillion, as I said at the beginning. We are talking about a system that is completely unaffordable now, and is delivering bad outcomes. If we introduce Medicare for all, there will be increased costs to cover everybody decently. Yes, that's true. We will want there to be increased costs because like the dad who uh, wouldn't go to get treated because he was afraid to go to the doctor because he was afraid he couldn't afford it because his insurance wasn't any good, okay? Uh, all of that goes away under Medicare for All, and you do go get your checkups, you do go get your treatments. So the costs for coverage will go up, but at the same time, and this is critical, under Medicare for All, we get massive savings by dramatically simplifying the system. What do we do? Here, I'll talk about the two critical things that happen. There's others, but I'll talk about the two most important. Number one, we get rid of the private health insurance companies altogether. They are serving no purpose whatsoever. They are draining money out of the system. So here's an example. Uh, private health insurance companies spend 12% of their overall costs on administration, marketing, and profits. The existing Medicare system for people 65 and over spends 2% on administration, 12% versus 2%. So we totally get rid of all of those things that are not doing anything in terms of improving health care under the private health insurance system, uh, in fact, are contributing to worsening health care. And we save massive amounts of money by uh, uh, agglomerating everything within our single Medicare for all system. And the second thing we do is we, uh, we control pharmaceutical prices. Again, actually there's nothing really to debate. You look at every other advanced economy, they spend 50 to 60% less on prescription drugs than we do, okay? 50 to 60% less because the government bargains on behalf of the people. Similar to what we actually do in the United States for the veterans in the Veterans Administration. The Veterans Administration pharmaceuticals are 50% less than what the average person now pays. So if you do those two things, uh, introduce it within Medicare for All, and you do a few other critical things, you end up with a healthcare system uh, that covers everybody well, everybody uh, is going to be able to see the physicians, the providers that they want. They don't have to worry about paying for anything out of pocket, okay? They don't have to worry about, yeah, getting their legs stuck uh, in the subway crack, in this crack between the train and the platform, and then not being able to afford a ambulance, insane kind of thing. Um, they'll be able to do that and our system will, the costs will go down 
uh, from what we're now paying 3.6 trillion to something like 3 trillion. So the next time you hear any politician say, how in the hell can we afford Medicare for all? It's gonna cost $3 trillion. Uh, remind that person that our, we are already paying $3.6 trillion. So uh, that's the basic thing that I'll, I'll stop with here. And then uh, I'll be very happy to uh, get in discussion, take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Polin. Uh, if you have a question, please throw it into the Q&A. And uh, we already have a few. I'll start it off. The, I, I'm going to kind of combine two questions, uh, one from Taylor Whiting and the other from Diane. What are the origins of privatized healthcare? Why did we move into this direction? And then going into Diane's question, what can we do to make Medicare for all? Why, do, why does the government not accept these facts? Well, the facts are before us. Uh, there's really no debate about the facts. It's just most people don't talk about the facts. So if you, yes, you know, if you follow the Democratic primaries, uh, and we had a lot of debates about Medicare for all before COVID, of course, that was probably the number one issue. Yes, you heard the, some of the figures say, the system, well, we can't, we can't probably, it's gonna bankrupt us. Impossible. It's right. going to save money. It's going to save money. Now, it's true the money gets channeled differently. Instead of you either at your job or privately paying to a private health insurance company, them gobbling up their trillion dollars before they actually do anything useful, uh, we cut all that out. And so everything is uh, within the government and that therefore uh, we get big savings. Now, how did we end up with this system? whereas mm -hmm. other countries uh, developed such uh, vastly different and much more efficient system. Well, you know, uh, there have been uh, uh, struggles around this for decades. Uh, and in other countries, there were struggles. It didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. In Canada, for example, uh, you know, what they have, the Medicare for all, um, it, it, it took decades. It started in uh, some of the smaller provinces it was introduced um, in, in these smaller provinces. It was shown to be successful. And then once you have this one test case that works, um, then it, it uh, proceeded throughout the whole country. In the United States, in 1965, when we did introduce Medicare for people over 65, the original idea was Medicare for all. In fact, right. this was Harry Truman when he was president in the, in the 40s. He was in favor of Medicare for all. Barack Obama said before he became president, he was for Medicare for all. They're all for it. So uh, in 1965, when Medicare was passed, um, it, it was a big fight. And the insurance companies fought tooth and nail. At that time, the physicians uh, were adamantly opposed. The way we even got Medicare that we have was essentially they bought off uh, the physicians by saying, guess what? This is going to work for you because you're going to get to charge a lot of money and, and your fees are going to be guaranteed because we're the government. We're going to guarantee it for people over 65. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, there have been, you know, and there are now movements to fight for Medicare for all. I mean, I, my own research on this started in California with the proposal just for the state of California. And, uh, you know, it was the nurse, National Nurses United California Nurses Association that really has led the fight. And if we could get it in California, you know, your governor in California now, Newsom, he ran in favor of Medicare for All. This is the pattern. He runs on it. He gets into a, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to offend any supporters of Newsom, but he runs on it. Then, oh, let's have a commission. Uh, let's think about it for a couple of years. He has a commission now. There's some and, good people on the commission. And like you're saying, just like in Canada, if that were, if California or a, a major state in, in America were to show the, 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 show that it worked in America, it would be easier for the rest of the states to start taking upon that proposal. Is that kind of what you're mentioning right there? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are issues if you do it in a state. I mean, California is the best case because it's effectively a country. There's more people in California than there are in all of Canada. 
Right. So uh, we could do something in California, and and I I was involved in that. Um, but uh, you know, you there are some detailed complications because the federal government actually has to agree to it because mm. you know a lot of the money for Medicaid comes from the federal government now. There's issues around you how you'd arrange the financing, but be that as it may, it certainly can be done. And if anyone wants to spend a really difficult, boring evening, you can read my study on California uh, that I did a, a couple of years ago. But um, you can also do it at the national level. Uh, it can be done. Um, for example, at 25 years ago, Taiwan, that is one third of the uh, per capita income of the United States, they just decided they're gonna do Medicare for all and they just did it. And they introduced it in less than a year. And it works and people like it. For that matter, in 1965, when we introduced Medicare for the whole country, for everyone over 65, wasn't all that complicated. It was introduced within one year. We didn't have information technology mm -hmm. then, you know, people had to send out cards and all that. Uh, it can be done. It can easily be done. Can you talk about a little, uh, uh, so there's so many misconceptions about Medicare for all and what that would entail about seeing a doctor. Can you just speak a little bit about the gigantic myth that you could not see your doctors anymore, that, that the government would choose the doctors for you? How would that work uh, uh, at all? There's no reason, and, and in the bills, so, you know, Bernie Sanders has introduced the Medicare for All bill in the Senate. Pramila Jayapal has introduced a bill in the House of Representatives. And in fact, I was on a uh, webinar just two nights ago with Pramila Jayapal. Um, it, it says by law that you can see the physician of your choice. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's a piece of paper and it says it in law, but then people say, oh, yeah, but in practice, uh, that's not, it's not really going to happen. How can it happen? Because the system is going to be so complicated and more people are going to be able to get access to medical care because they have coverage. And so the physicians are going to uh, be jammed up and not be able to see any, the people. Now, you have to th remember one thing. Under our existing system, probably some of you have heard from your providers, uh, physicians spend 15 to 20% 20, 20 of their time on paperwork, filling out forms. I know this, mm -hmm. I've studied it, I've looked at the survey data. I also asked my own doctors. I just said, how much time do you spend on filling out forms? Right. And my primary care doctor said 25%. Wow. Uh, now, that time, that's not time is not gonna totally go away, but about 70% of that time is gonna be freed up to see patients and to give treatment. And so that therefore, in fact, there will be more time. There will be more opportunities to see doctors and, and the doctors actually will mm -hmm. have more billable hours as a result. They're gonna end up fine as a result of this. Uh, so it, there is no reason, there is no reason whatsoever why you can't run Medicare for all with people being able to have access to their providers that they want. Great. Uh, from Nancy Nanny, I understand that in some countries, higher education is free, so doctors are not left with a very high debt after they graduate. This also seems to help cut down on patients' medical expenses since doctors don't need to charge as much. Is this something else that the U.S. could consider? That's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's a good answer. I, I don't really have to add too much. Okay. Everything Nancy, she you said is your own exactly question. right. <laughs> And in fact, uh, you know, there's been some, some actually very valuable research done exactly on what Nancy, it was Nancy, right? Nancy Nanny. Nancy was just talking about. Yeah. Um, that sure, if, if we change the system through which people get medical degrees, uh, so that they don't have to spend so much yeah. on, medical, on a medical education, uh, they wouldn't come in with all this heavy debt. Mm -hmm. And then, the, yes, they wouldn't get to be charged so much. Now, the, uh, one of the most important studies on this uh, showed that actually medical students are really subsidizing the research of their professors. The professors mm -hmm. are around a few hours a week, then they go off on their own, and they're not hanging around with the students. 
but the students are paying for the doctors to be able to have time to do research. So what we really need to do is shift the research functions into a public agency, yep. and then medical education could then also be much less expensive. Great. From Diane, I know a few years back trying to find a trying to find or find trying to find a doctor for my senior mom. Many would not accept her as a patient if she only had Medicare. I live in a town with a lot of, of seniors. Has this attitude changed or will it change if we do have universal health care? I wish uh, we would just do it. Great question. So the, the reason any physician would, would not accept a Medicare patient is because uh, private health insurance uh, reimburses at higher rates. You make more money mm. with patients mm -hmm. uh, that, can, uh, that have private health insurance as opposed to Medicare. And so under Medicare for All, uh, we either have a uniform rate for all patients. So it, it doesn't matter how old you are, uh, what conditions you have, it, it, you, you, the physicians get paid exactly the same. So that, again, that eliminates that problem altogether. Uh, from Michelle McGregor. Dear Robert, I am curious if you have an opinion on American citizens' personal responsibility for breaking systems that keep us broke and without a vote. For example, I can't imagine Americans don't realize that when they shop from big corporations for just about every single thing they purchase, we are just continuing to put money in the pockets of the people who benefit from things like private health care. So while I agree that our government should make massive change in our healthcare, I also feel like people don't play their part in our day-to-day -day choices by shopping local small businesses. Do you agree? Well, that, that's a really great point, but you know, it's, it's difficult. Let's, to, in the case of healthcare, it's difficult to come up with uh, alternatives. I mean, if you, I mean, at my job at the University of Massachusetts, you know, they give me a list these are your healthcare choices if you're employed here. Now, I suppose I could turn them all down and try to find some really great egalitarian private health insurance, but I don't think anything exists like that. I've never heard of it. So there's, you know, there's difficult choices involved. Take another example, which uh, is not gonna put me in such a good light. I mean, I know how bad Amazon is. And I try not to buy things from Amazon, but you know, sometimes I do. Uh, and maybe some of you do as well. Uh, it is very convenient. And uh, so uh, these are the, these are the uh, contradictions that we face. I, I totally agree that I shouldn't buy from Amazon at all. I should buy all my books from the local bookstore and all my birthday presents and all that uh, locally. That's actually even harder now because they're all shut down. Uh, but I, I, I very much agree with that. Is certainly the sense of that question. Uh, from a, a, an Englishman, Jim, Jeremy, are Americans going to get over the idea of socialism? How are you going to convince the Republican side, let alone the Democrats? Is there any real, I think he meant to swap those. Is there any real will to make this happen even after this pandemic? As an Englishman here, I can't see it happening. Well, if you believe polling evidence, uh, Medicare for All polls it like during the pandemic. It's polling at like 75, 80% approval. I, I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, in red states, I think the number in Mississippi 65% for Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. So I think actually there's overwhelming support. Now, what happens is just as we saw in the Democratic primary is the real facts get obfuscated and you have some, you know, very articulate politicians that will come up with arguments and say, this is why it's impossible. And they're wrong, uh, but you hear it. Now they aren't representing the 65 or 75 or 85 percent of people say, "Why can't we just have a healthcare system that's affordable and that I can have access to it and I can be treated decently?" Okay, that's the premise of Medicare for all. That's why everybody's for it. So what you hear instead is hey, it's going to cost three trillion dollars, and they don't just say the very next line, which is, "Yeah, wow, three trillion dollars—that's saving uh, 600 billion." Right. 
relative to our existing system. So there is support. Where there is not support, of course, there's overwhelming opposition. Look, you know, the private health insurance companies, the pharmaceuticals, as I said at the beginning, if we're spending 18% of GDP and we could be spending 10% of GDP, they're siphoning off a, a trillion and a half dollars. Or to be conservative, round it. Let's say they're, they're only siphoning only one trillion dollars. Right. Uh, you know, again, that's like pulling $4,000 out of the pocket of every single man, woman, child, baby, uh, elder person in the whole country. So they will fight tooth and nail and they will buy as many politicians as they can. Um, I, so he was mentioning, he, he wanted to add on, he meant that the Democrats also don't see, this is true, he said the Democrats also don't seem to make Medicare for all a real thing. The Republicans stopped Obama's first idea of a Medicare. Will they, I mean, you don't, I don't know if you, you can't predict the future, but will they learn in this pandemic? Obviously all these individuals who've just lost their health care from being fired, uh, what, what do you think is the furthering of that? Um, well, I think, you know, I said, I was just on this uh, webinar night before last, um, and it was sponsored by this group, Our Revolution, which is, was an outgrowth of the 2016 Sanders campaign. And, uh, and, and Pramila Jayapal is the leader of the Medicare for All movement in the House of Representatives. And they have something like 130 members of the House of Representatives who have co-sponsored Jayapal's bill. Mm -hmm. So I forget exactly how many Democrats are in the House, but that's close to a majority. Right. If, if they have a majority of House of Representative members um, in the House, um, they can introduce a bill. And that would be historic because, okay, forget about the Republicans, but all the Democrats are going to have to stand up and vote. And if they vote no, they're going to have to answer to their constituents. Yep. Why are you against this thing? that is gonna be better for me, better for my family, better for the whole community, and cheaper. Uh, I think we'll, uh, I, if any, no one else has any more questions, it's, it is, it is a very popular, lots of, lots of questions. I think I'll end with, what would be a furthering of this? What would be a good step forward? Do you think a public option would help ease our way into it? Or do you think the, we need to primarily just shift, make the complete shift over? Very hard question. So we're ending with a tough one. Yeah. Uh, the public option uh, has a lot of problems. Um, one of the problems is that, you know, basically one of the benefits of Medicare for all is that you create what we could call a one risk pool. The entire country mm -hmm. is in the same health insurance program. And so that you have people who are getting sick, you have people who are not getting sick, we're all in the same thing. And so that it's very, it's easy to figure out exactly how much you have to spend on average, because you have a risk pool of 330 million people. If you have a public option, what you are going to get is uh, on, uh, almost certainly the people who are in more difficult situations are going to get forced into that risk pool. And the private health insurance companies are going to create ways to attract mm -hmm. the healthy people. So that is going to serve ultimately to delegitimize right. uh, the public uh, version. On top of that, the public, with a public option layered on top of the, the private system, you will, the, the costs will not go down. So the thing I'm telling you, you know, the average person is going to save 10 to 20 percent on health care. Um, that won't be the case. So people won't see the benefits. So it will be difficult. On the third hand, uh, we know there's huge resistance. We know that Biden, for example, Pramila Jayapal told us the other night that, you know, she is she was on this joint commission with the Sanders, the Unity, yep. Biden. And, and she said, look, the, the, the uh, Biden people said, no way, no way, nothing to discuss. We're not going for Medicare for all. So they did, uh, they did fight for some components, for example, controlling the uh, pharmaceutical prices. So that's a, a major step forward. It's not Medicare for all. 
And just once again, we are the only country in the developed world, correct, that it does not have a universal health care. Only, only high income country. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Polin, for joining us. And I, I know everyone was quite uh, enthusiastic about uh, this presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for the last event uh, in Pick Plays Series One. Uh, if you liked what you saw tonight, please donate to GoFundMe uh, so we can produce this again uh, in the fall. Thank you once again. Be safe uh, during this pandemic. Great job. Thank you.